Uh, the development plan is in two parts. There is the strategic development plan, which as the name kind of implies, deals with high level stuff, and which he also mentioned the local development plan, which is much more detailed. And in the case of Aberdeenshire, we have a new strategic development plan that was just approved last August. And we are in the late stage of producing the next local development plan, which should come to in, into effect at the end of this year or early next year. So we have quite an old current LDP, but planning is always dealt with by the current LDP, not what might have been in some previous one or what might be in the next one. And I specifically want to talk about the, the mystery, as it were, of how we decide on individual planning applications. So technically speaking, we are dealing with a quasi-judicial regulatory process. The council decides whether to grant or refuse a planning application by reference to compliance or not with the pre-agreed framework. And that is the development plan. And that's what, as Paul pointed out, that's what the legislation requires. And I think folk will see immediately that one of the purposes of that is, or one of the reasons for that is that, that a, a, a very definite purpose of the planning system is to remove uncertainty. If it was a lottery, what got granted and what didn't, um, individuals, households, businesses, you name it, would end up putting an awful lot of time and effort and money into preparing planning applications without any idea in advance as to whether they would uh, likely end up getting planning permission. And as Paul pointed out, by having pre-published, which have been subject to extensive public consultation policies, people can see in advance whether what they're proposing complies with policy. And if it fully complies with policy, they have every reason and every right to expect to get planning permission. So the actual process of taking the decisions for the council, in most cases, planning applications are dealt with by planning officers. They never come to a committee. They never come in front of elected councillors. The council has delegated to officers in the planning service the power to decide on most planning applications. So if you put in a simple planning application for a house extension, um, it of course will be subject to neighbour notification and so on, but nobody objects to it. It's got no issues for anybody else. It's fully compliant with policy. This does not need to come to committee. That would cause unnecessary time delay, uh, in unnecessary expense. It's absolutely straightforward. It clearly complies with policy. An officer can grant that. But as you get into more complex, larger, and shall I say more controversial planning applications, the chances are that they will come in front of a committee of councillors. And that in the case of Aberdeenshire will be in the first instance, the local area committee. It might in some cases go on to the infrastructure services committee. And in some cases, it will definitely go on to full council because the legislation requires that. The question for the officer taking the decision is essentially the same as the question for me as an elected councillor if I have a planning application in front of me. And it's not, do I like this planning application um, or do I agree with this planning application? It is, does it or does it not comply with planning policy? And it's immaterial whether I personally like it or not. The planning policy is the one that has been approved. That is the, the, the local development plan policies that are in place. And the question for me is whether or not it complies. And that's the question for the council as the planning authority. The default, as I think Paul mentioned, is to grant planning permission. But planning um, applications can be refused, but there has to be a planning reason to refuse. If there isn't, it should get planning permission. And essentially that reason will be non-compliance with one or more policies in the development plan. But it's important to remember that planning is quasi-judicial. The council can grant planning permission, even if an application breaks planning policy. Um, we, can, we can depart from policy is the term that's used. We can grant something that's against policy. We have to have a planning reason to do so. But that's different to, to say a court. If, if you were dealing with a court case, and the consequence of the, the, the court case was, for example, that somebody had been found not guilty. The judge wouldn't have the option of saying, well, actually, it's quite clear you haven't broken any law. But, you know, I think your behaviour was appalling. I'm sending you down for six months. That option isn't there. It's absolutely rigid. Did you or did you not commit the crime that you've been accused of? In the case of planning, there is more flexibility. We can grant planning permission, although something is against policy. Uh, 
it's very important that people remember that this is an evidence-based decision. We get a lot of representations. In fact, we get a lot of representations just from Paul Davidson, but we get a lot of representations from hundreds or thousands of people in some cases, in some individual applications, and people make a wide range of points. But as I think Paul emphasized, the important points are planning points. They are, you should refuse this application because it breaches this policy, or you should support this application because it furthers the aim of the plan. The issue is not the identity or popularity of the applicant. You know, and, and again, if I use a court analogy, the notion that somebody would um, be found guilty of a crime because he's a very unpopular individual who's been accused, or that somebody would get off committing a crime because actually they were a very widely liked person would, would clearly be inappropriate. The same would apply to planning permission. Um, we get people making representations that you know they gave money to charity last year. Well, so what? I mean, very nice of them, but it's nothing to do with land use planning. So it's not a popularity contest. It's not about how many letters of support an application has. It's about whether or not it complies with planning policy. Planning takes place in public. Representations are documents. So if, if people write in during the period of representation, their letters of representation will be published. They are documents that form a formal part of the consideration of the planning application, as do the responses from consultees, as does the planner's report. The whole thing takes place in public. There's a principle of transparency and, uh, and of no surprises. Each side, as it were, should be able to see what the other side is saying. So it is all fully disclosed. Uh, Paul Davidson mentioned um, members of the public emailing councillors and writing to councillors, which of course is perfectly entitled to do. This is a democracy, anybody can do that. But that is private correspondence. Councillors won't use that in a planning meeting. Whereas a letter of representation sent in during the, the period of public representation that can be referred to and indeed will very often be cited. You would, you would hear that if you went to a planning meeting. So in terms of people's involvement, well, firstly, planning applications are considered, those that come to meetings, are those, those are public items on the agenda, as indeed is almost all council business. So you can come and sit in the audience as a minimum. Um, there is a 21 day period for written representations, which will be rigidly enforced, but the cutoff is the end of that. Um, however, if something has to be advertised, and some applications do have to be advertised, it'll be 21 days from the date of the advert. And in practice, that means there may be more than 21 days. Community councils have the option of asking to be treated as statutory consultees, which means they're likely to get longer as well, not an indefinite period, but longer than the 21 days. In the case of Aberdeenshire, anybody also has the right to ask to speak at a meeting where a planning application is being decided. Uh, now, they don't have a right to um, they don't have a right to speak, they have a right to request to speak, but in practice, requests to speak are almost invariably granted. And so people can write a letter of representation. They may, of course, indulge in private correspondence with councillors. Um, and of course, they can also speak at the meeting. So the process is very open. There are multiple opportunities for people to have representation in the decision on the planning application. But as I think Paul Davidson made clear, very often crucial decisions have been taken at an earlier stage. If a site is included in the local development plan as allocated for housing and somebody comes in and applies for housing on that site and complies with all the other relevant policies such as window to boundary distances, privacy distances, proportion of affordable housing, um, every, every other relevant planning policy, that person is going to end up getting, or that developer is going to end up getting planning permission. And people who object at that stage to the principle of housing on that site have essentially missed the boat because it's already allocated for housing. So it's very important that people do have an understanding of the nature of the process, the, the gradual removal of uncertainty, the gradual in, gradually increasing levels of commitment to a particular outcome for a particular site. I think it's also worth pointing out that um, you can't remove somebody's right to apply for planning permission. Anybody can apply for planning permission to do anything, to build something, to change the use of something at any time they want, and the council has to take a decision. And you do not need to own something to apply for planning permission. Indeed, many developers will apply for planning permission on, on land they don't own, because if they don't get that permission, they don't want to own that land, it's no use to them. 
uh, you have to tell the owner, but nevertheless, you know, somebody can can write me a letter or let me know that they're going to apply to put planning, put a for planning permission, put a skyscraper in my back garden, and I can't stop them making the application. They're unlikely to get permission, I would say, because of planning policies, but nevertheless, that you can make that application. So there is a a I, I think of a pretty transparent process, but it is quite a complicated process and it's a, I think a necessarily complicated process. I agree with the point that Paul made that those particularly developers who are using the process to earn their livelihood and provide things that frankly all of us use, nevertheless they will be very well versed in the system and they have a lot of time to do to 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 devote to that and they know what they need to do at what stage. It is obviously much much more difficult for random members of the public who are not professional planners to use the system like that um, and but that is that is how the development process works and those are the opportunities to influence it now what i do want to do now just in my remaining few minutes is just make a few points that maybe will generate some discussion later and some of them may be partly a response to points that that paul made as well just for by way of of um controversy if you like. So uh, we get very large numbers of representations on planning applications. A lot of them cover relevant points, but we do get quite a lot where people have spent a lot of time and effort writing a letter to raise things that are simply not land use planning considerations. So firstly, it does not matter who the applicant is. It doesn't matter whether the applicant is Mother Teresa of Calcutta Adolf Hitler or even Donald Trump. The personality, behavior, and identity of the applicant is irrelevant. There are very good reasons for this. Firstly, those things aren't land use planning concerns. But secondly, planning permission, if granted, goes with the land. So even if Mr. Smith gets planning permission to build a house on the site, Mr. Smith can sell the land the day afterwards to Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown then effectively has the planning permission because it stays with the site, not with the individual. It's not granted to a person, it's granted to land. So forget the identity of the individual, forget the um, behavior, the virtue or lack thereof of the individual and forget motivation. If somebody applies to build uh, an, a bedroom extension on their house, the planning committee will not discuss whether in fact the two younger children could continue to share a bedroom and they don't really need it. The fact is they want it, they've made the application. The land use issues are whether it overshadows the neighbors, whether it will dominate the streetscape, whether it will reduce the size of the garden to a, a point where the, the plot ratio is no longer satisfactory. Issues of that kind, not motivation. We have issues with um, planning applications where there are very large numbers of representations. Paul touched on these. There are almost in always large numbers of hostile representation for things like sites for travelers. Um, that's routine. But remember, this is not a popularity contest. This is not a plebiscite. The question is, does it comply with the planning policies? And the fact that we get some often pretty nasty and sometimes, frankly, very overtly racist uh, representations, those are irrelevant matters. And they, they can be and they should be. And I hope they would be ignored completely. Um, just to put it in perspective uh, for other housing, there is often hostility to housing. We had a developer in Aberdeenshire a few years ago. He's no longer trading, but we had a developer who particularly specialized in building affordable housing units for some of the housing associations, but also on his own account, tended to build small numbers of very large, um, I think the detached executive villas is the term for, I've never met a detached executive, but there must be a lot of them out there. Um, and he, he, he used to get uh, representations on those housing sites. And I remember commenting on a planning application on the fact that he couldn't win. Uh, when he applied to build a very large detached executive villa, there were hostile letters pointing out that local people wouldn't be able to afford the housing. And when he put in applications to build the affordable housing in association with housing associations, we got letters of representations claiming that there would be a crime wave in the locality as a result of this housing being occupied. So there are, there, are, there are good reasons why this is not a popularity contest and why this must be conducted on the basis of compliance or non-compliance with policy. Um, I think one is generally advised not to mention the war, but I, I do, I think, have to mention the war in this case. 
easily the most controversial planning application that I can remember in my what nearly 22 years of councillor has been the, the Trump golf course at many. Um, that was a particularly bloody affair for, for me personally, but for an awful lot of other people as well. Um, that was a case where there was clearly an enormous level of public support. I mean, we had 2000 letters of representation, but a planning application that didn't have a leg to stand on in terms of planning policy. It contravened numerous environmental and housing policies. And it was, in my view, absolutely rightly refused by the planning committee. Um, a very unpopular decision, quite clearly, but nevertheless, in planning terms, an absolutely correct decision. Um, and based on policies which had, after all, been subject to wide public consultation and had gone through due process to have an approved local development plan. And I guess, finally, the only other point I want to make, since we are here in a climate cafe, is just to comment on how the nature of um, uh, planning applications that come in front of us, I have seen change over the last 20 years. When I was first councillor, we didn't even have uh, a policy on renewable energy. And then we started, we then did produce a policy on renewable energy because we got the first few wind turbines. And then there was a point when the council had to form a special group of officers dealing with just wind turbine wind turbine application because wind turbines were one of our main items of business and we were dealing with dozens and dozens of applications simultaneously all over Aberdeenshire. Uh, at the last area committee, which was a week ago today, we had the first application we've had at the Geary area committee uh, for a battery energy storage facility. That's another part of you know, reshaping the energy supply. In this case, we'll store, as it were, surplus electricity at times when wind turbines or other forms of renewables are generating more than is required to store it so that it can be then deployed uh, when, it, when it actually is needed or perhaps when generation is less. And that, that was a first for us, but it's not going to be the last because the whole system of providing energy uh, is, is necessarily and rightly changing. And the planning process has a significant part to play in allowing that to happen. Um, can I just finish by saying that I there, there are there are always criticisms of planning. It is a inherently controversial and inherently adversarial process. It's one of the most difficult things councillors do. We sit in meetings where you know half the audience want the thing granted and the other half don't. And you at the best you come out of the meeting, half of them are upset with you, and very often they're all upset with you, and that's life. But you know, those decisions have to be done. There has to be a planning process. Decisions, I think it was quite right back in 1947 to nationalise the right to develop, which is effectively what happened. And I think it's quite right that the um, local authority, which is under governed ultimately by elected local representatives, is the body that takes the decision on what should or should not get planning permission. And it's quite right that it should take that in relation to a set of policies that have been subject to public consultation. It's not perfect by any manner of means. Paul's criticism, for example, of neighbour notification entirely justified. The current strategic development plan in Aberdeenshire has got arguably mutually incompatible aims in terms of sustainable economic growth and tackling climate change. There's plenty to criticise, but we need a planning system and we need one that's operates fairly and we need one where we have planning policies up front. And I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin. I guess what my <laughs> is a bit frustrating. I think that that you can go against um, the LDP to grant plan permission, but you can, I guess, do it to refuse plan permission. We okay. would be on. We 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 would be on very shaky ground if we refused a planning application which had no policy ground for refusal. Because to refuse a, to refuse a planning, the, remember the default is that a planning application is granted. If you're going to refuse it, you have to have a reason to refuse it, and that reason has to be a planning reason to refuse it. Otherwise, it's completely unreasonable, and therefore there has to be a policy reason to refuse it. If you refuse something and you can't give a reason why you refused it, not only is your decision likely to be overturned on appeal, but you'll probably have costs awarded against you because you have manifestly behaved unreasonably. If you want to grant something that is against policy, you have to have a planning reason for doing that too. And that will be recorded. So that the council will need to explain why it has departed from its own policy. 
Uh, I have to say in committee meetings, sometimes I struggle with just how rational the reasons that some of my colleagues give are, but nevertheless, there does have to be a reason. Yeah, and I think so therefore it's been very clear throughout both of your talks that the, the real need perhaps if to change if in relation to sustainability and um, that presumption of development uh, or maybe put conditions on that on that for sustainability. And that's a nice way to segue into Claire's um, talk. So welcome.